Um, when I smell those roses, I, I suddenly am all these pictures in my mind that may have nothing to do directly with roses or whatever may be triggered. And the word for that is called um, sensorium. It's a, it's a uh, adjective that means when you listen to music, like when you listen to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, immediately you have images of the universe, the cosmic aspects of the universe. One of my favorite pieces of music, which I highly recommend to everyone, the opening of the Ring Cycle by Richard Wagner. Um, I, whenever I play it and people come over to my house, people say, well, what, what Brian Eno is this? And, you know, Brian <laughs> Eno is a, a modern British composer who writes you know, a variety of different kinds of music. But this, this thing is so timeless that this person who was trained musically thought that it was a piece written within 10 years. And I highly recommend the opening of the Ring Cycle. It's a big influence on what I'm doing, kind of especially in the 3D card work. And I want to address that for a minute. The other difference in this work, it's much more, you know, a direct line from my brain to the piece. In other words, it's line and paint and that's it. So it's much more, I would call these much more acoustic quote unquote pieces, whereas I'd say the dimensional piece, I mean the carved pieces, the carved wood relief pieces are much more based on uh, an or or orchestral reference, uh, like Bruckner, Wagner, Mahler, who had 140, 150 piece orchestra, heavy duty romantic and literally they're heavy and figuratively they're more heavy uh, and heavy in a sense of um, I think obviously when you listen to Bach or Mozart it's a lighter emotion usually not lighter in terms of shallow but lighter in terms of weight when you listen to the more romantic composers it's, it's heavier does everybody know what I'm talking about? Um, in other words, if you look at the, the other thing that I think is really important to uh, think about is that for every kind of art kind of movement that you're looking at, try to access the music that would correspond with that. There's always a relationship between um, a certain kind of music that you're interested in, there's always going to be a visual counterpart and an architectural counterpart and a furniture design counterpart. For example, one of my favorite parts of the D'Orsay Museum in Paris, I don't mean to keep talking about that, but for some reason I am. But the first thing I do is I go up to the third floor, the third floor, which most people don't go to, which is the furniture and design department. There's nobody up there. It's the most mind-blowing, in many ways, part of the museum because there are these bent wood furniture pieces that even, I don't think anybody on the planet could even do them. I mean, the amount of money and time and technology to do those things I don't think exists anymore. And I think the over-the-top, unlimited time put into art like that has rubbed off on me because especially in the carved and painted pieces, um, they're really, if, if you do like them and if you do um, you know, warm up to them, it's because of the amount of time I put into them. And it's a direct relationship, and it's also true about my trips to India. The first thing you notice, you're more shocked when you come back here than you are when you go there. Those of you who've been to India may know what I'm talking about. The first thing you notice is how quick and transient everything seems here, and how we don't spend time on things like we used to, but we don't do everything is kind of monocultured and mass produced and somewhat soulless and especially bland. When you come back from India, everything looks gray and uh, bland. When you when you come back from Europe or Switzerland or France or India or whatever, you're you know you're higher than a kite from a society that's actually working and supporting the arts. And then you come back here and you're you know wondering why isn't why isn't there more support for, you know, non-mediocrity? Well, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a big fan of, you know, classical music, but, and my mom right here is a huge musical snob, and some of her snobbery is rubbed off on me, so anyway, you have to forgive me a little bit. Um, I actually agree with her quite a bit on her views of um, 
I think that, that but anyway, I think that one of the things that, that, um, that like in Stanley Kubrick 2001 A Space Odyssey, I read a book about the making of a movie and there's an interesting thing about it and that is, everybody asks, well why in the last scene did he put this kind of 18th century French room, French, specifically French, and Kubrick said, oh, well, the superior civilization, if they looked at our world, they would consider not the Enlightenment, not, I'm sorry, not the Renaissance, but the Enlightenment as being the pinnacle of human achievement. And the Enlightenment, you know, produced, early Enlightenment, basically produced this country. I mean, the, you know, the enlightened people started this country and uh, the French Revolution, you know, later Mozart, early Beethoven, the whole, pinnacle of, you know, the great French and Italian and, you know, German art of which came out of the Enlightenment. And it was a period in which religion had a very reduced role. I just read an article that most of the founding fathers, for example, were, were not, were actually atheists. <clears throat> they believed that now, but they weren't, they, they said they were sort of Christians, but they weren't really Christians. And they were just, anyway, it's the whole idea of separating church and state, which I wish we would get more into now. Um, now, in terms of the, would, one, one more thing I wanted to say, which is the philosophy I really like, which is that I read recently that history and art are kind of the same in one sense because it's really based on, when you read a book about history, it often reflects more the writer of the work of fiction rather than the history itself. And I think that's true for all art. In other words, I don't want to control too much in my talk about how I think you should experience these things. I think you have to do it, do it yourself. And I think the art, if there is any art in them, is experienced in the individual viewer and in your own mind. Um, and the, um, that is kind of what I think art is, essentially. If, I mean, if you analyze music, for example, it's just a bunch of sound and rhythm on a purely scientific level. It's just kind of noise, but yet our brain converts it into great art. And I think that's how this is, too. This work here is that the, the, the art is something that goes on in your own head. Therefore, I want my pieces to be non-specific enough to be able to have the viewer participate in the experience. I don't want to, uh, what I'm really against, in other words, I really don't like one-liner art. And there's a ton of it out there where you go in, you get it, and you walk out and you're done, and that's it. And so, much, so many movies are like that now. You go to the movie, you're entertained, you walk out of the theater, an hour later you forget about the so it's not a thing at all. It's like a video game. It's like instant gratification. Or like fast food is like this. Just in, out, done, no soul, no anything. Just completely planned. Now this stuff I'm trying to, that is kind of my form of rebellion against the world at large. Is trying to create a utopian situation. I'm, I mean, people saying, well, isn't this just like escapism, this stuff? And they say, oh no, it's, it's escapism because it's, trying to create a picture of a better possibility, a better world that could happen. I'm really influenced by um, uh, writers like Gary Snyder, the, the writer who um, actually is from went high school in Portland, went to Reed College. Um, he's still alive. He, I've written him. He's written me back a couple postcards. I can't say anything on that, but at least he's written me back. <laughs> and anyway, he, I did meet him, and I, it was amazing meeting him, and I really liked his essays, especially on, um, on the idea of, he's definitely a utopian, he definitely thinks we should be more na nature-centric, we should have much more respect for the natural world and live in a much more integrated way with the natural world. Um, he, anyway, he's a big influence. Uh, Tom Buell over here is a poet. He's, I mean, everybody's been an influence on me, people that have affected me. Tom's an old Portland, I mean, a, a poet. Um, thank you for coming. But anyway, um, people like Michael McClure, um, William Blake is a, is a big influence. Um, he said that um, you can see the universe in a rose, and there's a piece back there called Poppy, 
Um, in this case, I switched the title to copy, but the idea is if you stare at one small detail of nature, sometimes the entire universe sort of tends to open up. And we all know that um, when you look through a microscope, there's, there's a lot in common with a microscopic view of something and a macroscopic view. When you look at, um, I was looking at some Hubble telescope photographs that Dad over here, um, Maruk over there, um, showed me these amazing pictures from outer space, and they looked, they it looked like kitschy art in a headshot. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I realized, well, maybe, maybe these, maybe these acid heads in the '60s were onto something. Maybe, maybe that Albert Hoffman was invented a great drug. I don't know. The point is, is that that there is something in our brains which is we don't really understand yet. And I was reading some R.D. Lang, one of my favorite British psychologists, and for some reason I've been on a British trip lately. But anyway, he talks a lot about that fear and hate and all the bad things about the world and human nature are rooted in a fear of ourselves and a fear of our own minds, and he calls it psychophobia. And so I'm relating some of these pieces to, and another thing he talks about is that that the reason we lock up schizophrenics and stuff like that is that we're intolerant and we're less open to different kinds of experience. But I tend to agree with that. I think that if we were more tolerant of different kinds of experience in our culture and we allowed more things, then we wouldn't have all the problems we have right now. Um, but anyway, I would love if you ask any questions. That was a what about your technique when you're creating the uh, carved ones? I mean, can you tell us something about yes, it? Yes, absolutely. Which, I mean, some of the, all of them, all of the carved pieces, because they're so labor intensive, and I don't want to, you know, find out that I'm, you know, three quarters through, and all of a sudden it was just a big disaster, and I got to cut it up and burn it. So they, they are somewhat planned. They're, they're, I start out with a plan, quote unquote, a vague plan maybe, and then at some point the plan switches to improvisation. I read you know, a, a famous artist history essay and this guy was saying that all art, the whole creative process is a combination of um, choreography and improvisation. And if you think about it, it's really true. And so I always start by choreographing something, and then at a certain point, the improvisation takes over. I was talking to Andy over here about his wood turning, and he was saying that, you know, you have, we were both agreeing, you have to be sort of on, on when you're doing this thing. And one of the stresses of doing this for me is sometimes you're not on. And you have to like, you don't know what to do and you have sort of a breakdown or whatever and then you somehow figure out how to get back on. And um, I think that's why a lot of people in the creative arts have a lot of lifestyle problems because when you're not on, for example, if you're a jazz musician or a, some kind of musician, you're not on and you have to be on, then you're more likely to medicate and do, try to do something about it because it's, it's um, sometimes you, you don't, you're not on and, and uh, you have to force yourself to sort of get on the track. And I think that the analogy of a train on a track, sort of going full blast is an analogy I like a lot. When I think, I think of art as sort of a verb, is, is like an a action. I don't think of it as a static thing. I think of it as something like action and activity. And I don't think things matter unless you do something. I'm really influenced, it sounds like pop psychology, but I'm really influenced by also two American, uh, Napoleon Hill, I like his writing a lot, he wrote a book called Think and Grow Rich in the 30s, it's still in print. Then I like How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. It's actually a brilliant piece of work of genius, it's an American genius, and it's, he's changed me a lot. He says, never argue, never criticize, never do all this stuff and suddenly I realize he's right and everything gets much better when you just <laughs> treat people with basic respect. And I think we live in a kind of a, in some ways, a disrespectful world out there. And anyway, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create an escape from the 
world out there which um, seems to be very troubled right now. And there is a lot of good art, I want to bring this up, there is a lot of good art that's reflecting the trouble out there. But I'll let somebody else do that kind of thing for now. I started out in my 20s and 30s really getting involved with that. I was started out by, you know, me liking German Expressionism and um, American Expressionism, but especially German Expressionism was a huge influence on me. And then I sort of got out of that and I realized, you know, angst and youth, eventually you just grow up and you move on. Sort of. <laughs> 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 Back to the question of what you said No, I never use any power tools. The only power tools I use, I on the wavy ones, the undulating ones, I do use a router. To get down. Yeah, I use a router and I remove. Um, I, I'm kind of a snob with tools. I, I do not like power tools. I never use any. I never sand. I never. I my tools are um, Henry Taylor from Great Britain, and then I use Swiss and German tools only in their. Um, they're worth it. They're very expensive. Um, you know, you just, you, they used to be like $5 each wank. Now they're like $80. <laughs> you know, I, they're really like specialized tools. And um, I use, first, I often, the foundation of all art, even in some sense, you know, architecture, sculpture, painting, large scale drawing, is drawing, right? So I do draw on the block at some point. You asked me that. You asked, right, the, the technique. All of everything, to some extent, is based on drawing. You know what I mean? Now, these things, like I just said, these are more a direct line from the brain to the, the product, whereas the other pieces are much more step after step after step after step. And the challenge for the really ones that take three or four months, that big round one took by far the longest of anything in the entire show. That took about, you know, an uh, expanded time over, over a year, but probably, you know, actual time, probably three months. And because when I reached a certain point, I, I basically, on the really involved ones, I have a guy that I call up who comes and helps me with the final bill because I don't want to screw them up. You know, I mean, with that much time, you know, 400, 500 hours of pace. Um, um, the other thing about these um, metallic pieces is that they come alive, especially, I think this is my opinion, when the light is lower. And there's some art uh, that looks better in darker light. One is Rothko, Mark Rothko is an obvious example. A lot of African art, in my opinion, looks better. Egyptian art looks better in dark light. In fact, the Berlin, I mean, the Egyptian Museum in Berlin, um, it's all black, and the, the, the art is lit up with spots. So it, it's almost a, it's almost like you're in, in the middle of a pyramid, you know, it's in a modernist sense, replicating the experience of, of what the Egyptians were doing. Um, but the, the other, any other questions? Um, yeah. Yeah. What influences your palette? Um, <coughs> oh, that's such a good question. Um, in the piece over there, like that, that one, that one, I forced myself to use colors I don't like. Yeah, that one. Um, that I don't like. And I generally, I just have a prejudice against earth colors. I don't know why. I don't know where it comes if I If I like, get a convention and the person says, do whatever you want, I'll all, almost always use colors like this. Because I like bright colors. But I also, I really know how, I mean, I shouldn't, what influence is mine? I think the most recent influence on this show, I'm trying to directly answer the question. I'm sorry to go off on all these tangents. But I think French art, French art. I think the French are genetically superior at color. I mean, sorry about every other culture, but there's something <laughs> they're, they're just like so good. They're like, they've got cooking down and they have color now. I mean, like, the, I saw a bunch of Spanish painting down and you know, I went to the Prado and I was strangely not moved because I realized Spanish painting is based on value, darks and lights value. And I prefer um, things that are based on color, the 
so I'm really, really interested in color. Um, and I think a lot of the bigger pieces are it's, uh, about layering and arriving at a kind of color that I like rather than a pre-existing agenda. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't say I'm going to do like a red thing and then do it. I generally, in the middle of something, and I'll think of, oh, maybe I should try a red. And then many times I, it doesn't work, and I'll switch it to green. Or this one, I was telling you know, Andrew that this started greens and reds and fairly bright colors. And I, you can't tell now, of course, but I completely painted out all the bright colors. And now it turned it, it turned it morphed into a green piece. Um, this one is, uh, I don't need to talk about this one, but, but this one, so it can change. I guess it's like this. I knew this writer one time who said that he was a novelist and that many times the characters in the novel would start taking over like, and telling him what to do. You're Charlie Larson, right? And, um, and I think that that's how it worked for me, too. I mean, you get involved in a piece and eventually the piece tells you what to do. Tom, yeah. <clears throat> you're definitely on now, and the music is wonderful. Uh, that's my uh, first thing. But uh, I want to know about your hand. You talk about uh, the people still working as artists when they're 80, 40, 90. Right. How are your hands and your wrists holding up? Uh, well, I've got a broken collarbone, and I've got a broken finger there, and I've had to have, you know, I've seen acupuncturists, and, I wear a magnet sometimes. I mean, basically, the the 3D things. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to do them because my they're uh, they they are they do wear out the you know it's sort of like a um, but I whenever I feel numb or whatever I just stop working and that's what these are about. I mean, these are not as taxing, and so I'm trying to get into other things so that so that I can give my arms a break. But there are things you can do that I've been, you know, I read about. I, uh, Dr. Parks in Vancouver is this genius Korean acupuncturist who really did sort of save my arm. I, my arm wouldn't move for like three months, and he has some radical acupuncture techniques, and it really work. Um, but um, that's just just trying to stay on top of it and not overdoing it. Any other? Yes, please. I'm often in your mother's living room and uh, look across at 11 of your works on the North Wall. There's a glass uh, sort of light comes in. And five of those 11 are, are wood you carved, and as the light just barely moves, they, they're, they're alive. They're changing. The shadows and the dips uh, clearly move. You do that on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think I think great question. I think it's um, squaring with what I talked about earlier that to me for my, what I'm doing is the art is a verb. It's something that moves, that changes, that's dynamic and not static. And that includes the experience when I'm no longer a part of it. I, um, I think that it's a little bit like this. It's sort of like when you stare at the ocean. It's always blue. It's always the ocean. It's always the same. But it's also always different. You know what I mean? Or another analogy is like when you look at the patterns on the sand and the wet sand, it's random, but yet it's perfect order through the randomness sort of thing. And so it's always changing, but it's always the same. I really am interested in paradox, things that are opposite that somehow match somehow. Um, like in this one, arrange, derange, it's not necessarily that those two things are incompatible. It's more that they're, in other words, there can be more than one truth. Uh, that's what R.D. Lang, I think, is getting at. In his, um, he's kind of the new Freud. He's still very controversial. But he says that you can, 
like like a person and hate a person and like Mozart and like um, you know some the Sex Pistols and that's allowed. Whereas other people take sides. You know, it's, it, he wrote an essay about it. It's called Us and Them. It's a famous essay that he wrote. It's about we tend to think, oh, we have we're us and they are them, and they are and they create hostility and war. He's saying that once you understand that the apparatus is at hand, hopefully to maybe unify people more. And I'm trying to unify a lot of information, especially in the car pieces. And one way I'm trying to do it is that um, carve, carving, and this is related to your question, carving is something that's real. It's real, it's a three-dimensional reality. Whereas painting is not real, it's illusion. It's all, it's all fake. Painting is the art of illusion. Therefore, when you integrate something that's real and something that's not real, that's why these things are, that's where they're coming from. And that's another opposites attract thing that's going on. And you know what I mean? Like, I'm fascinated with, I think it's possible to be, like politically, you can be a liberal and a conservative. You don't have to be only a liberal or only a conservative. I don't understand people that take sides. I mean, every, but the bottom, the more practical way of saying it that Shannon here has said many times is that Every, everybody and everything is a mixed bag, good and bad, or, you know, light and dark or whatever. And so it's like a yin and yang concept. These, my most euphoric pieces, I imagine, have something in them that's not euphoric, and the pieces that are less, you know, less utopian have something in them that's very positive. Um, I'm very interested in, in these pieces almost have a Frank Lloyd Wright, Anne Rand sort of quality. Now if you say you like Anne Rand, you're kicked out of most left wing places in a second, but I think she had some good ideas on paper. On paper. You know, not you know, I know that she's you know, she's radioactive, but <laughs> but but, um, but for example, I don't understand why feminists don't embrace her more. She's one of the most brilliant original thinkers who was female of the 20th century, you know, yes. I'm interested in the fact that when you look at your close up, it looks so different from when you look at it from way back. You see altogether different things yeah. with a different scale. And I'm wondering when you work on them, do you go back and forth or do you put yourself in one place or how do you, how do you get these, these, these large and small differences? Um, well, you know, when I, I obviously studied painting for quite a while, and I taught painting for a long time, and I used to tell my students, and because I discovered this through my own research, is that sometimes the best thing to do is not just look at your piece 10 feet away, 20 feet away, 30 feet away, but sometimes I would look at it 40, 50, 60 feet away, and then slowly walk in and see how it, how it looked from, distant, from different distances. I think it's a great thing to do that, but on these pieces, after you do that for a long time, you kind of know intuitively what they're going to look like from a long ways away, you know what I mean? And so, um, the answer is no, I usually don't do that. I don't look back at them much at all. I look at them, but I, I uh, uh, don't look at them for more than like 20 feet away, probably. And um, I think what you're getting at, I, again, to bring up um, Monet, like his, he did a famous painting, this is a good example, uh, The Field of Poppies, and you get up close to it, and it just, it looks completely chaotic. And it looks like if you did a close-up of a Monet painting of that era, it would look like, like an abstract expressionist painting almost. Then you get back, and it's perfect, um, almost photographic, Clarity, not photographic, but a picture, a three-dimensional picture of a poppy field. Whereas these, the thing that unifies them to some extent, I think is the consistency of the carving, the consistency, relative consistency of the color. But you're definitely on to something in that I'm trying to have as much possible variety 
and at the same time have it unified. You know what I mean? And it's sort of it's sort of like if it's too unified, it's boring. If it's not unified at all, then it falls apart. So there is a there is a certain um, you know there is a certain and there is a certain point at which you have to impose order to contain the chaos. You know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. as, if, as if the parts are, as Don pointed out, alive. You know, the, the other thing is the round pieces are more, um, because they're more organic, and when things are more organic, they need a more obvious mechanism to hold all the information together. Does that make any sense? And one way of doing it is to have the perfect order of the, if you think about it, I mean, there's a famous thing that there are no straight lines in nature or no geometric forms in nature that actually is not true because you look at planets and they're perfectly round and horizon lines at the, at the beast are perfectly rectilinear. So I, I don't think that is necessarily true. One more thing I wanted to say about philosophical influences is that Schopenhauer, a, a German philosopher, wrote an essay called On Thinking for Yourself. And I think above and beyond every, the most overarching thing that's the most important to me, and I encourage other people to do at all times, is to think for yourself. And I don't listen to most of the media anymore at many times because I think it's all propaganda. I think people should think for themselves. You can be exposed to anything you want, but you should make your own conclusions about what you're experiencing. And this work, I, I think there's, um, it's an integration of painting and sculpture and two dimensions and three dimensions. And so I'm trying to do that in my own work. You know, I'm trying to do my own thing. And I know that some people get it and some people don't. But any other? What's that? Do you feel inspired or influenced by any Northwest artists? Of course. I think that this is one of the most um, underrated regions. I, I um, right next to you is a Northwest master, George Johansson. He was an early influence, um, great teacher and influence of mine at the Museum Art School. Um, Clifford Gleason, Louis Bons. I met and knew all those guys when I was a teenager. Milton Wilson was a huge influence. Um, we were really good friends, although he was a very volatile, uh, uh, you know, in some ways, a crazy guy, the, the most beatnik artist, you know, of all time. Um, every drug in the book he tried, you know, and all that. <coughs> um, he was pretty wild, but um, he was a big influence. I mean, he was a great artist, too. Um, one thing I wanted to add, I've been reading a lot of Gary Snyder, the word Northwest, I don't, I kind of have lately been rejecting, because I think, yes, it's the Northwest of the United States, but traditionally, it really, should, this region is really more part of the Pacific Rim. Mm -hmm. That's how I like to think about it. I think we're, we've always been very much informed by Asian culture. Much, I mean, if you think about the East Coast, it's much more of a European influence. Um, and we, the West Coast has always been more, you know, it's originally where all the beat and hippie movements, you know, San Francisco, and the number two beatnik city was Portland, Oregon, by the way, because Gary Snyder, Philip Whalen, um, several other original beatniks came, you know, were schooled here and came from here, and there was a big beatnik scene here in the 50s. I, I know a person named Jack Ireley used to talk about all the wild clubs in the 50s here. I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of interested in finding out more about it. But I met some of them, you know, when I was a teenager, some of those guys. Um, uh, Rachel Hibbert, her dad was an influence. I studied life drawing with him. Jim Hibbert, who used to teach at Portland State. Yeah. The answer is, of course, I mean, I've come right out of that. I was born in Oregon, so. But um, I'm also influenced by California art. I don't think California, I think the, I like the Ecotopia book. Do you remember, does anybody remember that book? <laughs> but to me, the region here is from Northern California to Vancouver, BC, kind of, uh, is what I'm influenced by. I think uh, Northern California is 
probably more as beautiful or more beautiful than Oregon or Washington. I mean, like the redwoods are one of my favorite areas. Tom? Yes. Talking about influences, I remember you went, uh, you are saying when you went to the Pratt Institute and studied there and then came back in New York, you were in New York for quite a while, you came back and you reported to us uh, that New York is provincial. Well, <laughs> 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 I met these guys, they were, you know, these coffee shops in Madison Avenue, and I'd say, well, yeah, they'd say, where are you from? And I'd say, well, Oregon, and I, I, I said, you should come out and see the nature. He says, why would we want to leave New York? There's nothing, like, there, that's ridiculous. And then I realized, well, it's sort of like Steinberg's map of, you know, these people, they tend to think, you know, like Lexington, Madison, Central Park, and then New Jersey, and then Kansas, and then Oregon. It's kind of, it's always bothered me because it, I kept, I, when I lived in New York, I kept running into the same people, even though it's supposedly a big city. It really is a bunch of neighborhoods where the same people go to the same restaurants, and I go to Christine's coffee shop and run into Larry Rivers and you know some other fairly, fairly famous artists, and it wasn't a big deal because they all tended to live there. And um, I don't like I like the West Coast much more than the East Coast. It's just you know where I'm from, I think it's much prettier, and I like the people more. And, I like the writing more. I mean, most of my favorite writers, Charles Bukowski, Gary Snyder, you know, are, are from the West Coast. One of my, my favorite Jack Kerouac novel is called Big Sur. Not on the road, Big Sur. It's about his experience of going down to Big Sur and staying in a cabin. And just, it's an amazing piece of writing about why the ocean is so attractive. And, you know, when I go down um, to the to me, the most beautiful, most amazing part of, again, Pacific Rim is the ocean part of the Oregon. I do like the desert and, and all that. I know, I think that's something you can't change what you're attracted to. And you know, some people like Bend, and I know Don does and everything, and I do, but for about three or four days, and then I want to get uh, something probably early child experience, the ocean is something, a big influence on the way I think about things. I mean, the idea of this work, that round one, for example, I probably, I mean, it could be, when you go to the ocean, the smells are amazing. The air is amazing, right? So in a sense, scent, the title of that also relates to, could be the ocean, could be a floral thing. There's tons of flowers in that piece. And it could be an underwater thing or, or a, you know, a, uh, like an oceanic garden or an oceanic experience of some kind. Um, what was the question? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any, any other? <laughs> any other? Yes. Uh, marvelous, marvelous show. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. You said you started out with a plan. And I'm wondering if the plan is, I'd like to uh, pose the question first from 60 feet and then, and then quickly from sure, sure. Sure. two feet. Sure. From 60 feet, is the plan an emotional one? That is, uh, I want to express that the world can be seen in uh, a rainbow. Or, right. or is it a practical one? That is, I want to do a copy uh, that pulls people into the breadth of the world. And then the question from two feet is, so when you carve these incredible complex pieces and you're working on a little nodule, uh, are you thinking, this is silver? Uh, and are the colors laid out when you're working on it? Or you do these amazing shapes and then step back and say, okay, how do I color these? Great question. In fact, you're addressing something I should have addressed a long time ago. These are definitely done in stages. Definitely done in stages. In other words, boards laminate in step one, um, drawing on the block, step two, carving the initial carving, step three, fine carving, often with magnifying tools, mm -hmm. step four, initial painting, Step five, step six, um, overpainting, what I call underpainting is first, and then overpainting over the underpainting. And then each time you do that, I've been influenced a lot, I keep talking about my influences, but um, I was reading about Greg over here, his photograph of me, I was telling him, we were talking about the Beatles, and I was saying, that I, I really liked the Beatles from 1966 until 1969. He said, oh, you mean you like George Martin? And I realized, and then I looked it up, and sure enough, it's 
what made them great was really George Martin. I mean, they were great, you know, had great concepts, but the guy that made it happen was their, it was all about their production. You know, they, they stopped touring and it was all about spending months in the studio fooling around with dials and I kind of think of myself a little bit that same way. It's like, I like to be both the work blue collar guy and I also like to be the post-production guy. Greg is in the film business. He, he's worked with David Lynch and different amazing, Gus Van Sant, different directors. And the film industry is, is like there's 40 different guys and each is, you know, myopically, spawn, um, you know, in charge of one specific part of the film, whereas the visual artists, are, we have to do all 40 jobs, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so part of, especially the car paintings, there's a huge amount of post-production work. I mean, after the carving's done, it's not done yet. You see what I mean? And I think the reason I carve, paint, and gill, that comes, I think, from my trips to India. Because the, the Indian art that I saw, they would never think about just carving something. That's not, they're really interested in excess. They're the opposite of Japanese. You know what I mean? But the, I remember going to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London a long time ago, and I remember being most blown away by Japanese art and Indian art. Yet they're, off, you know, that's the, the two poles of Asia, kind of. Mm -hmm. And for me, I naturally am attracted to Indian art because of the Baroque excessive. The, the irony, one of their amazing ironies, the most excessive Indian art is the, are the Jain temples. Jainism is an obscure, you know about it or not, it's an obscure Indian religion that's a combination of Buddhism and Hinduism. And they don't believe in harming a fly. I mean, they're covered with, they just count rice all day and they're, they're, I, they're the most extremely, they're like, they're Quakers. They're like Quakers, extreme Quakers. Uh, yet, their art is incredibly Baroque. And so, I don't know how to explain, because I'm not knowledgeable enough about how to explain things like that, but clearly the excessive hedonistic aspects, of especially the carved work, come from um, my travels. You know, and, and one thing that our culture tends to not like, I don't know what, why it is, when you go to Europe, like I was on a Blue Tonza flight, and I sat next to this Austrian guy, and I told him my website, only my website, and he just bought something. In other words, the, the, there's much more a lot, a direct line in European culture, at least my experience, where they like something, they buy it, or they support it. If they like classical music, they'll go to the concert, whereas here, we're much more feel guilty about pleasure. And you know, they think of music and art as a form of pleasure, like fine food, fine cooking, um, you, you, does that, everybody know what I mean? And I think of, in some ways, I am interested in pleasure, my art being something that is a source of, you know, I shouldn't have said this, but in the Willamette Week thing, I told them I wanted to be like, you know, drugs. And what I meant was, <laughs> you know, instead of taking your Prozac, why don't you just get one of these, and you'll, that'll cheer you up a lot better. And, uh, but, but it seems like, um, it seems like, I think the reason a lot of people are on pharmaceuticals is because our culture doesn't provide the high that it should for us. We all have a need to get high and to experience life as something other than just drab and dreary and negative, you know what I mean? And, and I think that's what I'm trying to do to some extent in my work, and I thank you for the compliment. <laughs> Then uh, why can't we use our imaginations? You mean you, this? These are meant. That's another good comment. These are meant to stimulate the imagination rather mm -hmm. than yeah. be a a thing that puts the brakes on imagination. See, my my objection is when I go to a show, and even if the work's good, mm -hmm. I'll I'll sometimes see the work, and it'll be something that like drags me down and I want to go home and just slash my wrist and hair. <laughs> and to me, the world is already depressing enough right now. 
We don't need any more negativity. And so my new rebellion is to be try to be ultra positive. <laughs>
just curious, you've written a statement that expresses your thoughts. So similar to what I
Look at that. That's all it's just like. Yeah, to hear them. You know what I mean? It's just the color of the one. Yeah, okay. Um, Great to hear all the different colors. And then the colors are just yeah. things that bring it together. Behind exactly. You know, call it yeah. that over painting where you're just yeah. painting on top of what's already there. Yeah. What do you do for this building? You were talking about somebody bringing somebody in to do it. Uh, just two of the bigger pieces. It was confusing because mostly I do my own building, but okay. I do like crediting other people who do help me. So I. They're not here, but they, um, the two pieces, I, that round one and then the other round one, I had a guy, um, you know, he, just because, you know, you put so much time in something, you don't want to mess it up. Yeah, yeah, I think it's good to bring in some numbers. Mm -hmm. Is it gold leaf, silver leaf? Uh, some of them are real 23 karat gold leaf, some are silver leaf, some are aluminum leaf, some are composition gold leaf, um, all different, but a lot of the gold ones are real gold. Uh, yeah, the quality of gold is really inspiring the other types of gold leaf. I actually sort of prefer, I don't really think there's that much difference. Yeah. I, I don't think it really matters that much. That's real gold. Yeah, that's real gold. Well, do you ever have artists over your studio? Um, I usually don't do that unless it's like organized or something. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, just because actually it's sort of boring. My, I don't really have a studio. Kind of. I mean, I just have a tiny room where I carve it soundproof so I don't make any noise. And then I do the other things in an upstairs bedroom. You know what I mean? I don't yeah. really have a regular studio kind of okay. thing. But, yeah. But no, I, if you want to organize something or whatever, yeah, I probably like you know, whatever. Right. Okay. Well, Mark. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Come over. Okay. I appreciate the yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's gorgeous for you. I'm excited to see what you're going to do next. I don't have no idea myself. This might be it. Right. Take it. I feel like getting more.